let's move uh, to, the, to the talk. Uh, the talk is given by, by Lenia Battiato, who obtained uh, the, her degree in, uh, in environmental engineering uh, with the highest, highest honor from Politecnico di Milano, my, my university, in fact, in 2005. I personally know her supervisor, Alberto Guadagnini, by the way. Uh, simply, simply, she obtained a master in, in engineering physics, uh, and then uh, she moved to University of California, San Diego. And in 2010, she completed a PhD uh, in engineering science uh, with a specialization in computational sciences. She held a postdoctoral position at Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization in Göttingen, Germany. She was faculty in mechanical engineering department at Clemson University from 2012 to 2014 in the mechanical engineering department at San Diego State University with a joint appointment at the Computational Science Research Center at SDSU from 2014 to 2016. In 2015, she received the DOA Young Investigation Award in Basic Energy Sciences for her work on multi-scale model in porous media. And she joined the Department of Energy Resources Engineering at Stanford University in 2016, where she is currently assistant professor. And she will give now a talk exactly on multi-scale system modeling. The title of the talk is Upscaling and Automation, New Opportunities for Multi-Scale System Modeling. Um, Elenia, the floor, the virtual floor is yours. I uh, stop sharing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Luca, for uh, the kind introduction. Let me see if I can get this to work. Um, so can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay, perfect. Okay. So, well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Luca and Masha, for uh, the invitation. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, as Luca mentioned, uh, I'm currently um, at Stanford University, and our department just changed name this year. Uh, it's now Energy Science uh, and Engineering in the Door School of Sustainability. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, upscaling and automation, new opportunities for multi-scale system modeling. Um, and um, my idea for this talk was really to uh, uh, kind of uh, dive in a little bit in the journey uh, that um, I um, started um, uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago uh, in the modeling of multi-scale systems and how I ended up essentially working in this um, uh, uh, in this particular aspect of, of multi-scale modeling, which is related to symbolic computing. Um, so it will be a little bit of an historical uh, overview of uh, what um, uh, my journey was uh, in this uh, type of, uh, uh, if, for the modeling of this type of systems. Uh, but before I um, uh, start uh, talking about the science, uh, I was very happy to uh, be able to actually uh, select this date uh, as the date of my talk. So uh, happy Women's Day to all women around the world. Um, I, uh, in honor of all women, I just um, uh, included two quotes uh, from uh, uh, a poet, um, uh, which I uh, really love is Maya Angelou. The quote on the left um, reminds us that um, each time we stand up for ourselves, we really uh, stand up for every other woman. Uh, and the other quote to the right is actually uh, from a very famous uh, poem, uh, Still I Rise, which I really love, uh, that reminds us that despite of all the difficulties that we may face as women, uh, uh, still like air uh, will rise. So uh, with this really, I wish uh, all women um, free and oppressed a happy Women's Day. Um, so now going uh, to the science, um, really the uh, global challenging that we are facing today is powering the planet. Uh, and um, let me try to move, sorry, my, uh, I have 
sorry, I have a bar that I, it's interfering with my view. Okay. Um, and so um, this can comprise uh, a couple of things, at least. The first of all, the development of clean energy, um, clean technologies and energy storage devices on one hand, and on the other to reduce the impact of current energy production by different means. It could be uh, CO2 uh, capture and sequestration, hydrogen storage, and so on and so forth. And so the work um, that I have done in the past and I keep doing with my uh, research group um, really sits at the intersection uh, of modeling um, uh, flow and transport in porous media that are relevant to the energy transition. Uh, and so uh, the system that we've been looking at um, uh, have been you know, very disparate. So we have worked and keep working on modeling um, lithium ion uh, transport in, in battery systems uh, and um, also uh, uh, reactive transport in uh, geologic media. Uh, and although one might suppose that these systems are very different, um, actually um, reactive transport in batteries and for example, in geologic media, exhibit striking similarities. And that's really the way that we think about these systems where we try to model them. So we know that uh, uh, transport in these systems takes place in hierarchical heterogeneous porous environments, uh, and it also exhibits nonlinear dynamics and often lacks of spa spatial and temporal scale separation. And so if we go and look specifically at this type of systems, this is just an example of what uh, you know a battery material looks like uh, across um, different scales. So we have a porous structure that compose the anodes, cathodes, and separator, and this porous structure can uh, have uh, pore sizes or particle sizes that can go down to the micrometer level. But then, of course, um, these batteries are, are packed in the thousands in a, an electric vehicle, which is ultimately um, the type of system that we would like to predict the performance of. If we now go to our well-beloved geologic media, uh, we also know that uh, geologic porous media and rock are highly uh, hierarchical structures and multi-scale uh, uh, structures, um, be it for CO2 sequestration, hydrogen storage, or for any other activity that involves uh, reactive transport in geologic media. And so the, the question that has really driven um, uh, practically uh, almost entirely uh, um, my career as I started working on this type of systems was the general question that uh, you know most people who work in porous media uh, ask which is how do we model multi-scale systems and this is clearly a very broad question um, but then I became particularly interested in the concept of predictivity. Uh, so what does it mean for a model to be fully predictive? Uh, and the way um, I uh, interpreted this uh, type of question was, can we really bound modeling errors? So uh, the idea was essentially um, to be able to a priori determine uh, whether the model I was I wanted to use uh, was accurate enough. And I knew exactly what the upscaling error would be as I were to deploy this model in some specific applications. Um, essentially, the idea is that I didn't like to have surprises and then discover a posteriori that my prediction was completely wrong just because um, I did not um, have full control of the predictive capabilities of, of the models that we developed. And we know that when we work with Poros Media, um, with the transport in porous media, at least we have a couple of options that we can start with. We can use pore scale models where we essentially would resolve the entire complex pore structure. Um, uh, here in this case, I'm thinking in particular about single phase uh, flow and uh, solid transport. And so if we want to model um, momentum transfer in this in the fluid portion of this of this um, um, uh, porous medium, then uh, I would use a Stokes equation if I'm at low Reynolds numbers, and then an advection diffusion equation for um, uh, essentially mass transport with appropriate boundary conditions. For example, here I have an heterogeneous reaction at the solid liquid interface in case, again, maybe these materials are reactive um, with the solute dissolved in the, in, in, in the fluid, let's say water. Um, and now at the pore scale, of course, we would model velocity, pressure, and concentration, which represents a local um, uh, uh, value of these velocity, pressure, and concentration fields inside the pore space. Uh, now, we can also decide to use continuum scale models 
Uh, and these are models that would represent exactly the same physics, but at a completely different scale. Uh, in particular, in continuum scale models, we, you would represent this uh, complex uh, structure um, that characterizes the porous medium as an effective continuum. So essentially you zoom out uh, far enough that all the uh, microscopic features kind of disappear, but, um, and now you would represent your system behavior in terms of uh, evolution equations for the average quantities. So in particular, for, for momentum transfer, we would have Darcy's law, um, uh, which holds for an average velocity. So this is a spatially a spatial average of the pore scale velocity of a representative elementary volume. We have an average pressure, and then we would have an advection reaction dispersion equation for the average concentration. Uh, and so one thing to note is that in principle, the form of these continuum scale models can be significantly different from their pore scale counterparts, although we still recognize some features um, that uh, you know are similar, like time derivatives. In this particular case, for this re advection reaction dispersion equation, what was a, a boundary conditions in the poor scale problem now becomes a source term in the upscaled equation. Um, another unique features of continuum scale or macroscopic models is that you, um, uh, as a result of the derivation of these models, you would obtain effective parameters um, that uh, are defined just at the continuum scale and not defined at the pore scale. For example, um, uh, conductivity or dispersion tensor of por or porosity. And so uh, we, with these options, we op also we have to recognize advantages and drawbacks of each models, because whenever we try to use and deploy models, we always have in mind a trade-off. And the trade-off is a trade-off between accuracy and computational cost. Um, and of course, this trade-off may change depending on the applications, our choices, uh, and our priorities. And so for scale models, we know that are obtained from first principles, so presumably they are very robust from a theoretical point of view. However, they have a primary disadvantage uh, that um, in order to solve this poor scale equation, these equations, these PDs at the poor scale, we need to know an exact knowledge of the poor scale geometry to th throughout the entire computational domain, which leads, of course, to high computational burdens, because not only the computational domain may be really large if we are looking at the macroscopic scale, uh, but also because we have to resolve, we have to use very fine grids to resolve all these minute features um, whose Length scale uh, separation can be really dramatic compared to the uh, macroscopic length scale. On the other hand, continuum scale models do not require a specific knowledge of uh, pore scale geometry. We just require a distribution of effective parameters in our continuum scale domain. And for this reason, um, they can be solved at much lower computational cost. However, the trade off here is that they rely, in order to derive them, uh, we need to make assumptions and simplifications. And so when I started working in this field, really, uh, I, as a modeler, I embraced um, this statement that everything should be, be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So I always was trying uh, trying to walk that very fine line between complexity and simplicity, where the, 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 the problems that I would choose were simple enough that could capture the dynamics or the type of, of could answer the type of questions that I wanted to um, look into, but they were not simpler than necessary. And so this really uh, is an approach that often people uh, uh, refer to as the spherical cow approximation and uh, you know physicists refer to as the spherical cow approximation and in porous media we have a similar similar uh, modeler's dream that neglecting higher order effects it's reasonable to assume that this complex porous media really can be conceptualized by a much simpler idealistic structure and that we can learn a lot from it and this is actually quite true that we can learn a lot from these uh, simplified uh, con uh, configurations um, because for example um, we based on this conceptualization now we can build um, you know theories uh, that allow us to actually do formally scale translation and so this is just a, a slide a crash course on homogenization theory which is um, uh, the method that we in the group use quite a bit, uh, where essentially you start from a realistic porous medium, you know, a porous medium with the realistic complexity, and then 
he essentially postulate that to some extent this con can be conceptualized by um, uh, a porous medium that has uh, uh, that has a periodic structure that can be represented by this periodic unit cell. And so the objective of homogenization theory, as well as any other coarse graining or upscaling method, um, is that starting from a, a, a poor scale, uh, um, a poor scale system of equations. In this case, we just have a standard advection diffusion equation and some you know, reactive boundary conditions on the solid liquid interface, um, we um, should be able through um, uh, some mathematical derivation uh, to obtain a continuum scale equations for that describes that spatial temporal evolution of the average of that poor scale quantity. And so now these continuum scale equations, uh, continuum scale equation can be written, as I mentioned before, they contain effective parameters, this, uh, you know, uh, effective velocity, effective um, diffusivity, effective reaction rates, and um, uh, these effective parameters can be uh, rigorously written in terms of what's called the closure variable, this sky in here. And this closure variable is a variable that satisfies its own um, uh, closure problem. This is a boundary value problem that is solved in the periodic unit cell. And so once we have the periodic unit cell that characterizes the structure of the porous medium, we have derived the closure problem through the homogenization theory. We can solve for the closure variable chi, then this chi can be fed into uh, these uh, formulas to determine the effective the effective parameters. And then these effective parameters essentially can um, fully characterize our continuum scale equations. Once we have the, the, you know, the values of the effective parameters and the form of the continuum scale equations, now we can solve for the spatial temporal evolution of this average um, uh, uh, quantity, average quantity of interest. And conceptually, what this uh, means is that at any specific location in the continuum domain where I calculate psi of, or the average of psi, uh, that uh, would correspond to up to some uh, errors of, of um, uh, established order, uh, this corresponds really to the average of the poor scale solution at that, co at that corresponding location in the, in the poor scale domain that is completely resolved. And so uh, I said that uh, you, you do learn a lot from, from the spherical cow approximation. So not only can you, you know, develop a new theories, but you really, when you apply these theories, you can start learning uh, features, um, even from very simplified systems. So, and this is an example that I always like to bring up because I think it's very clear. Again, it's as simple as possible, but it really captures, um, uh, uh, you know, important features of, of these uh, of multi-scale systems. So let's consider, for example, a classical Taylor dispersion problem in, uh, in, um, uh, in a channel where now, or in a fracture, if you like, um, where now the upper and lower boundaries uh, are um, reactive. And so at the poor scale, uh, what we have is an advection diffusion equation. And again, we have appropriate boundary conditions to represent the flux uh, of uh, concentration C through this reactive boundary. If I want to construct a continuum scale model from this poor scale model, then what I have to do first step is to define what the average is. And so in this particular case, because of the configuration, a natural way to define an average is to take the, the average across the vertical cross section. So we just integrate in Y. If I apply this averaging operator to the poor scale problem, and uh, this is uh, besides is a paper by um, Mikelich that was published in 2006, after a lot of pages of math, you would get these continuum scale equations, which is really what we expect. Expect. This is an advection uh, reaction dispersion equation, and it contains effective parameters. I would like to focus your attention on K, which is this effective uh, reaction rate that clearly depends on the poor scale reaction rate, the curly K. And it contains also this dimensionless number, the color number, which is defined as the ratio between diffusive time scale and reactive time scale. Now, uh, 
let's consider a scenario in which we increase k, so the curly k, so the reactivity of the interface at the pore scale. So if I increase k, so I'm not changing the physics, I'm just making this wall more and more reactive. So if I increase k, also the color number will increase. But if I increase the color number, what we notice is that uh, when the color number becomes larger than three, then the sign of k changes, which is, of course, an unphysical behavior because we are not changing the underlying physical processes at the pore scale. But for some reason, we, we, we essentially change the sign of this source term, which, of course, a very major physical implication if we were to solve this PD at, at this PD at the continuum scale. And so what you learn for the, from this very simple example is that essentially continuum scale models have applicability regimes. And after uh, when the color number is larger than a certain value, then essentially these approx the approximations that we use to derive these equations break down. And this really links back um, to my pursuit or of trying to um, uh, establish when and where we could build or whether we could build the models that were fully predictive where we could control the upscaling error. Um, so uh, this work really, uh, the, this idea really led to um, look at, you know, single component um, uh, nonlinear reactive transport. This was one of the initial works that I did where essentially I started looking at, at an advection, um, uh, you know, at, at you know conceptual uh, advection reaction dispersion problem, and what after doing multiple scale expansion, this is the the um, technique that that I used at the time, um, which consists is essentially representing the core scale quantities in terms of fast and slow variables perform asymptotic expansion matching like powers of epsilon and then um, you know do other procedure then you would get an homogenized equation um, and uh, their corresp its corresponding um, effective parameters so dispersion coefficient as a function of the closure variable and now Again, the interesting part, what we have learned, what we learned at that point was that, yes, we could obtain the closure problem, which again, we need uh, in order to separate scales, but that could be done only under appropriate constraints on the order of magnitude of relevant dimensionless numbers, so dumb color and Peclet number. If these, these constraints on the magnitude of dumb color and Peclet numbers were not satisfied, then the closure problem became fully coupled to the poor scale problem, which means that you cannot separate scale and you technically can not, not write um, an upscaled equation with single point closure approximations. And so um, this is the phase diagram that I came up with that was back in 2011, where essentially um, um, uh, we discussed the applicability conditions of these upscaled equations of, or the specific upscaled equation that we derived at that time. Um, and so if uh, um, your parameters, so down color and peclet fell within this gray area, then the applicability, the, the, uh, poor scale, the continuum scale equations that that was derived uh, essentially uh, was accurate up to errors of order epsilon uh, compared to the average poor scale equations. But if you were outside these applicability conditions, then you could not guarantee a priori accuracy of this of, of the predictive capability of this continuum scale model. And so um, the bottom line was really that there were constraints on the physics. So uh, generally, the, the general idea at that time was that if you have geometric scale separation, then you're good. So as long as your poor scale problem um, is, um, uh, the, the, the characteristic length scale at the poor scale is much smaller than the characteristic length scale at uh, the macro scale, then everything is good. In reality, you, uh, you needed also to have dy dynamic constraints to ensure full scale separation. And so, of course, uh, we then proceeded by saying whether we could increase complexity of these systems and still um, get similar results and whether that was feasible. And so we started looking at you know, more complex, slightly more complex system, multi-component nonlinear reactive system where we had an homogeneous reaction in the uh, liquid phase, A plus B goes to C, and then heterogeneous reaction on the interface. And now the complexity of the calculation, although the, the, the system itself is not complex at all, really, we, the, the mathematical complexity increased quite a bit. We now had 
three dimension, three um, dumb colors number for all these forward and backward reactions, and one Peclet number. And so you could do again this uh, with much effort. You could do again this upscaling and homogenization, and these are just a portion of the um, calculation that we had to do. And you would get these continuum scale equations, um, and you could construct this uh, phase space again to identify condition applicability conditions for the model that was derived. Um, but already for only three species, um, uh, we had uh, essentially seven or eight, two, four, six, seven, seven constraints. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see that, um, uh, you know, I had too many, uh, my dimensional, my dimensional space was already too big to be able to be drawn uh, on a, on a piece of paper. Um, and so, uh, that uh, really uh, showed that, you know, certain things could be really learned, um, but there were still quite some limitations because of the computational complexity of going into systems that were more and more complex. And so what we had learned by then, this was around, I think, 2013 or so, was that uh, homogenization theory, together with all the other um, upscaling methods that have similar features, um, could and should not be used not only to derive Darcy scale models, um, which of course have been a cornerstone of, of modeling reactive transport in porous media for decades. Uh, well, I would argue centuries since Darcy's law actually was postulated in the 19th century, um, but it could also offer a self-consistent framework to determine applicability conditions um, of corresponding upscaled up models. And the reason why these applicability conditions uh, are important is because they can essentially tell us when uh, or how uh, to, to rigorously assess macro scale model predictivity and accuracy um, uh, um, together. And also we could use this upscaled, this, this homogenization theory actually to derive coupling conditions when um, uh, upscaling methods uh, fail, but I'm not going to go into that uh, today. And so uh, at that time, uh, the, the promise of, you know, having this entire framework that was perfectly self-consistent um, uh, uh, led me to the believe that, in fact, we could create a, an entire conceptual framework that was uh, very rigorous and could also be deployed for real world applications to navigate optimally that trade off I spoke about before. Um, so the aim uh, back into, so this is a picture that I created in 2016 was to develop an optimal multi scale framework that was rigorously derived and shared a priori accuracy, but was also optimally designed for deployment by practitioners. And so the idea was that we have, you know, we have these homogeneous upscaling theories. Again, I was working particularly with homogenization and I we could use these um, upscaling theories to do physics-based uh, model development that was rigorous and we could essentially get um, models at each scale of interest, but each model will, 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 would come with this diagnosis criteria or applicability conditions well, applicability conditions that could be turn, turned into diagnosis criteria to establish whether that specific approximation was correct at any specific deployment moment, time and space. And so the deployment would be physics-based and it would be optimal. So the idea was to start from clearly coarser, um, uh, um, coarser uh, models, upscaled models, and then only if and when applicability conditions would be violated, then essentially downscale in such a way that this um, uh, cost accuracy trade-off could be navigated optimally. So that was all good in theory. Um, there were no leaks. Um, uh, we knew the theory was robust. Uh, we knew that an, enti an enticing aspect of all these approaches was the possibility of constructing multi-scale models that could seamlessly co connect. Sorry, I have to move, otherwise uh, my light goes off. Um, um, so that could seamlessly connect adjacent scales. Um, and the important part is that in the theory of these upscaling methods, uh, really, uh, no parameter fitting is 
necessary theoretically at coarser scale if the appropriate information at the finer scale is known so this was a, a promising um uh, a suggestion that maybe we could get to seamless predictive multi-scale models where we would just feed information at one scale and just carry this information all the way up rigorously without needing for fitting however in practice there were quite a few bad news so and the bad news were really related to complexity right so the mathematical derivation of these advection reaction equations at the continuous scale uh, is tedious time consuming it's prone to error even for syntactically simple advective diffusive reactive systems that i i showed you before that are nowhere close to anything realistic um uh, and also if you want to determine a priori error guarantees and sufficient conditions uh, it could take quite some time to derive them, uh, maybe months to a year, dep depending on the expertise of the person who actually decides to engage in this pursuit. Um, the other uh, complication is that uh, um, unlike uh, in the modeling world, world where we like to essentially work with complexity um, and with different degrees of complexity and navigate that, that fine line, unfortunately, complexity is not a tuning parameter in real world applications. And this is just an example. So when you do mathematics by hand, really complexity becomes a tuning parameter. But when you really look at realistic systems, that's not the case anymore. Uh, you have heterogeneity that definitely does not look as a you know, periodic structure, but more important, well, not more importantly, but equally importantly, you can get, um, uh, you know, in, in realistic settings, the reactions that happen are very complex and there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. Then the question for us became, uh, the challenge that we undertook became, okay, uh, we know that theoretically this could be done, but we know that there are real re realistic bottlenecks. Uh, can we really achieve predictive understanding of uh, through seamless models, uh, seamless multi-scale modeling while bounding modeling errors, but for systems of realistic complexity? Um, and so that's where essentially we started looking uh, uh, in a different direction than maybe um, what... Um, uh, the fashion suggests today, which is data-driven model, we started actually looking to automation uh, through symbolic computing. Um, we thought that um, really the bottleneck uh, of trying to integrate these very valuable rigorous strategies to um, realistic uh, applications where essentially most of the times the models are still quite primitive uh, and you know um, they, they really do not match the models that we develop in academia we really wanted to fill that gap um, but of course it would be unfair uh, and unrealistic to require practitioners to learn upscaling theory um, and instead the idea was essentially to fill the, this gap with softwares that could do the math uh, so that the human would be screened away from um, you know the mathematical complexities while be still be able to use um, the valuable models that came out of these reg rigorous upscaling methods and so uh, the needs uh, be and since this was also happening and this is also happening in an ever changing energy landscape um, where the critical role of uh, multi-scale systems be it uh, batteries surface storage for hydrogen will play and plays already a, a critical role in the energy transition, we needed to um, uh, address a few issues. So we needed fast development time. So we wanted to get, cut the development time of these multi-scale uh, models from years down to months. Um, we wanted controlled accuracy, we wanted computational efficiency, and we also wanted transferability uh, and framework generality. And so um, we essentially decided to look into what we think still it's a quite underutilized cornerstone uh, of computational physics, which is the computer algebra of applied mathematics. Um, so, you know, if you think about in an, if you think about comp computational physics in an abstract way, there is the disciplinary modeling. So this is the physics specific um, uh, type of domain. It, it 
like be it geolog transport in geologic media or battery, you know, the knowledge about batteries. Then there is the computer science is generally associated essentially with the numerical techniques that are used um, to solve uh, the models that are developed in the applied mathematics uh, kind of community. Uh, however, we have in the past, for the past decades, invested so much effort in these green and blue bubbles, right? We have invested a lot, correctly so, into advancing experimental techniques to look uh, in, at, in, at systems in unprecedented ways uh, with uh, unprecedented uh, time and spatial resolutions. And we also have pushed uh, really to the limit because now the more more law for computational scaling we you know we are done with that so we really have pushed the computational capabilities to its limit but we have always we we have naturally thought that the applied mathematics part was still always primarily a human endeavor and so our proposal or suggestion here uh, and opportunity here is that there is a lot of opportunity lying in this space and that if we uh, 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 invest um, in advancing uh, our ability to speed up our calculations, we can expand significantly um, the possibility of the domains that we can explore and the complexity that we can experience um, uh, in ways that we have not done before. Uh, so uh, and so uh, here, the big uh, the, the 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 concept that is left out is really uh, the more fashionable data driven approaches that we, for this particular application, uh, decided really to exclude just because they did not present the features that we needed. Um, uh, being data driven, the fundamental drawbacks were that they lacked error estimates, uh, extrapolation, and transferability to different fields because you need to train with data specific to the field. And so with this, um, we started looking into symbolic computing and um, it's uh, uh, very nice to be speaking on March 8th about the fact that in fact, the first person who had the idea of symbolic computation was a woman. It was Ada Augusta Countless of Lovelace in 1842. And she wrote this beautiful piece. It was a comment uh, on one of the letters that was written on uh, um, the Babbage analytical engine uh, that's considered the first, you know, computer essentially, many persons who are not conversant with mathematical studies imagine that because the business of the Babbage analytical engine is to give its results in numerical notation, the na nature of its processes must consequently be arithmetical and numerical rather than algebraical and analytical. And this is an error. The engine can arrange and combine its numerical quantities exactly as if they were letters or any other general symbols. And in fact, it might bring out its results in algebraic notation where provisions made accordingly. And so that's where we started really looking at symbolic computing, which is essentially the science that aims at automating a wide range of processes involved in um, mathematical physics. Um, and although symbolic computing is routinely used in a lot of branches of applied and theoretical mathematics, for example, combinatorics and also computer science, formalisms uh, as those involved in high level manipulations of mathematical constructs that are used, for example, in coarse graining theories and never been implemented before. And so that's what we did. We developed a code, Symbolica, that it's a symbolic software developed in Mathematica, which automates the upscaling procedure by multiple scale expansion. And this essentially allows to, uh, um, to allocate cumbersome symbolical, symbolic manipulations to computational resources, such that uh, large multi-scale systems that are common in engineering applications become more practical to model and uh, to develop models for. And so the objective really was to develop the 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 the, the, the time uh, the the development time of multi-scale modeling really by orders of magnitude. And so what Symbolica does in the in the last few minutes, I'm going to discuss a little bit the features of Symbolica. What Symbolica does is essentially to it takes in four scale equations, uh, any number of them, um, uh, any nearly any complexity, um, and uh, appropriate boundary conditions, and then essentially um, performs the upscaling procedure. Uh, we implemented homogenization theory by multiple scale expansions, but of course you can implement any type of other algorithm 
algorithm, if you wish to, and then it provides, um, as a result, upscaled uh, equations. Uh, together with the closure problems, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially, this is what I mentioned before. It takes as inputs, uh, poor scale equations, boundary conditions, some scales associated to the quantity, you know, to the variables involved in the systems. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, it requires also some master variables that helps it uh, define dimensionless numbers. And once all these inputs are provided, these are fed into Symbolica as a mathematical file, and then Symbolica proceeds with the automated procedure where it finds the dimensionless number. So uh, essentially non-dimensionalizes the system of equations. And then what it does is that for a given set of values of dimensionless numbers, it, ups, it, provide, it upscales the system um, and provides uh, uh, the upscaled equations. Now, I would like to emphasize that the upscaling is performed for every combination of values of dimensionless numbers that the user defines. This would correspond to spanning the parameter space, this, you know, highly dimensional parameter space that represents the applicability conditions, uh, essentially based on user specifications. And for every point in this parameter space, uh, Symbolica uh, um, uh, provide the upscaled equation for that specific combination of dimensionless numbers. So it can perform upscalings X many times, depending on how many combination of, uh, of dimensionless numbers are, are provided by the user. Uh, so this is just the structure of Symbolica. It has three different phases, which I'm not going to discuss, but these are uh, this is all published. Um, and so this is what I was mentioning before, that essentially once we have our dimensionless system that is here up in the right uh, corner and we uh, have our dimensionless numbers we associate as users um, the order of magnitude of the dimensionless numbers that we're interested in so that maybe we can span different physical regimes advective diffusive and reactive and once uh, these values of these dimensionless numbers are um, identified essentially um, uh, symbolica upscales this system of pds for every combination of these dimensionless numbers and can provide upscaled equation in each different um, uh, uh, regime. And so this is just an example for a super simple case where we have just three species, A and A goes to B and vice versa, and H produces A. Um, this corresponds already to seven dimensionless numbers. So we would have six dumb colors number and one Peclet number. And so if we associate three possible values to each of these dimensionless numbers, this corresponds to 81 points to be spanned in the parameter space, in this seven dimensional parameter space. And so these are just the list of all the points. And so what Symbolica does is that once you have specified these three values for each dimensionless numbers, it performs the upscaling 81 times, and therefore it provides um, 81 system of PDEs as an output. Uh, now, I just wrote here the output. It looks ugly, but now we have provided, you know, we have provided a nice interface that uh, looks uh, more digestible. Uh, together with the upscaled equations, it, it, which are written here where you if you look hard enough you're going to be able to find what you expect to find it provides also closure problem and then because the homogenization theory is such a self-consistent framework then we uh, we can of course verify whether these models that uh, uh, symbolica derives are correct and the way we do this is by checking this uh, a priori error bound that must be satisfied if the upscaling is done correctly. So we solve the poor scale problem, we average it in space, we solve the continuum scale problem, the, we calculate the difference, the error, and then we check that this error satisfies this the bound that is prescribed by upscaling theory. So then we started going back to the, the problems I had looked at uh, as a PhD student. And so what we found was actually quite interesting. So first we, uh, we started seeing that, in fact, the, in the work that I did, uh, because I didn't want to upscale the system a hundred times, but I wanted to do it once and then extrapolate, I had to uh, use restrictive hypotheses that effectively restricted also the applicability conditions. In reality, uh, the applicability conditions for that one species nonlinear heterogeneous reaction problem were much more forgiving, but 
the need of the human to perform it by hand imposed restrictive conditions that you know were very conservative uh, symbolica figured that out so we found extended applicability conditions cons uh, relative to that original work and symbolica found that out in 14 seconds um that was a humbling experience i must admit uh we did the same with the problem that i presented before of the two uh, species to a plus b goes to c and again Again, we found something similar that Symbolica upscaled to, you know, found the same PDs that I found, but was able to actually re, um, uh, release some of the restrictive constraints that I had imposed and that were not really necessary. Um, then we moved to a problem where uh, essentially a human probably wouldn't even try to, to do. Um, and this was just a you know fictitious reaction network with 10 species. This corresponds to 22 uh, dimensionless numbers. So we have a 22 dimensional phase space uh, and Symbolica could uh, perform the upscaling in two cases, reactive and advective case. And of course, we validated, we verified all these um, uh, results numerically in 65 seconds. So essentially, what Symbolica did was to do my PhD thesis in about 10 minutes. Um, uh, now, the current capabilities, and I'm close to the end, um, is that uh, we can model, we can model handle heat transfer in domains with heterogeneous inclusion. We applied this uh, to model thermal runaway in battery packs. We also expanded um, uh, the applicability conditions by generalizing the assumed closure form. Um, I won't have time to go into the details uh, of this, but uh, essentially now Symbolica can construct solutions for the, can postulate solutions for the closure variable that are much more sophisticated than we would otherwise, that, uh, we or I would otherwise have guessed um, uh, by using concept of superposition and that leads um, to um, uh, PD upscaled uh, PDEs that actually look very different from the one that we would expect, but are valid, for example, also in highly reactive systems. Um, and now, because we are not, uh, we don't have to do the math by hand, of course, we can also uh, derive higher order uh, approximation. So we don't have to truncate at epsilon, but we can go to epsilon square and we can also handle multi domain cells. Um, again, this is something that I just briefly mentioned um, in two preprints that are uploaded and this is currently um, under review it's work under review uh, what we propose is a strategy to formulate closure forms that are more sophisticated and as a result are able to account for much more reactive regimes so now we are able to upscale um, uh, uh, for them colors number that is much larger than what we could uh, upscale before. Um, this leads also to, sorry, this leads also to forms of the PDs that are very different that we are discovering terms that we know are correct and should be there, but now we are trying to find physical interpretation for them. Uh, this is just uh, an implementation of, uh, you know, higher or the inclusion of higher order terms. And we started actually applying these strategies to realistic uh, systems where now we don't have to, again, um, uh, reduce the complexity of the system to try to upscale and handle this, this type of scenarios. Uh, but now we can include, uh, you know, many more species we, really and just perform the upscaling um, very quickly. This is particularly work and we have applied this to hydrogen storage and CO2 sequestration. This is the work that was done actually by two undergraduate students during summer, so in eight weeks, under the supervision of Kyle, who is the PhD student, to actually develop this entire framework, automated framework. Uh, and so this was a phenomenal work that, you know, I wouldn't have been possible in the past. Um, and the students, of course, did not have to learn all the intricacies of multi scale of, of homogenization theory, but they could still validate the models that they derived. The Symbolica could handle these complex systems in only 15 seconds. Um, uh, I'm going to just as a last thought say that um, with this type of approaches, we can also do model discovery. Uh, again, we start to find terms that we wouldn't expect uh, to be there in the first place, although we know that uh, these are correctly there because we can simulate them numerically. Um, uh, with 
future developments include implementing time averaging procedure, implementing the upscaling of vector fields because we want to handle multi-phase flow. And so we want to be able to handle the upscaling of the Navier-Stokes equations and then awfully embed Symbolica into optimization framework. One last thing is what's beyond Symbolica. So, well, what you know, we showed is that really uh, we can, uh, with the correct algorithm, um, which again Kyle invented, with the correct uh, uh, computer algorithm, you can implement highly sophisticated um, theories, uh, mathematical theories in these symbolic in these symbolic softwares. Um, and so we demonstrated that symbolic software with novel recursive algorithm structures can actually be programmed uh, and used as computers rather than as calculators for step-by-step -step manipulations. Um, and, and so what we hope, and so we see a lot of potential uh, in the use of symbolic computation in essentially mathematical physics uh, and also in advancing um, you know, computational physics and the theories of applied math that have been uh, generally done by hand. Um, and so with this, I would like to acknowledge Kyle. Uh, again, Kyle was the PhD student that uh, created the invented the algorithm that allowed them to build um, the, the symbolic uh, homogenization capability in this symbolic software and then of course uh, the funding um, and with this I would like to conclude and thank you for your attention and I think I'm also quite late thank you Elenia uh, do you hear me yes I do okay thank you A very interesting uh, um, of course, the audience can now ask questions. There are two possibilities. Either you write uh, in the question and answer, and I think that there is already a question for you, or you can raise your hand uh, and uh, I will uh, give you uh, the possibility of, uh, of, um, of talking directly. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, let, let I read the, the question in the, in the question and answer. From the learn from spherical cow slide, is the uh, DA underscore, I suppose that uh, uh, was one of the symbols in the slide, including Taylor dispersion. Yeah, so so uh, the dumb color number that was defined in the paper by Michalic, uh, so it was defined in, in on the slide, but no, that uh, that dumb color number is a local dumb color number based on diffusion local diffusion coefficient. So a way to think about it is that that this really represent the ratio of time scales of local time scale between local reactions and diffusion and diffusion. Yeah. I think Sorin has a question. Sorin, Sorin, uh, I, I okay, yes, here, sorry, I can, uh, I will try to leave you, how, permission? I think I managed. Oh yeah, you can talk, you can talk now, yes. Yeah, I can talk, Good. thank you yes. very much. Yeah, thank you very much and, and my compliments for such a great talk and of course, my congratulations to the better half of the world. I mean, the ladies, we celebrate them today. Um, yeah, uh, this great talk. Thanks a lot. Um, and I, I really, I think that's uh, what, what, what you developed, this Symbolica package is very useful because I can tell you from own experience, it's not really uh, something you do in a nice afternoon deriving all this uh, upscaling, I mean, making this upscaling procedure. However, since it was mentioned, this spherical cow, and that was actually also a little bit my, my, my question, um, you mentioned regimes where things, uh, mod models can be homogenized from four scale to uh, Darcy scale. And whereas, okay, uh, high Peclet numbers, epsilon to minus two, of course, this, this, at least these techniques are not so straightforward. For high damp color number, I don't think there is, should be such a big issue. I'm wondering, I mean, why, why consider it non-upscalable? Because, for example, in the paper by uh, Andrew Mikelic and, and Hans van Dijn and, and Benson de Digne, they consider even infinite reaction rates, so infinite dumb color numbers. Well, when I think that when you, um, I think when when you go to infinite dumb color number, you like it's it's a limit where you. As I, again, I do, I'm not familiar with that work, so I, I don't want to speculate uh, exactly. Um, but um, uh, essentially, you go to equilibrium reaction. So I would assume, 
right? To me, the infinite damp color number is an equilibrium reaction, right? So uh, I would assume that the PDs you start with are different. Um, uh, in, in homogenization theory, uh, we see that um, you know, with class, I mean, you can work with them colors numbers that, you know, are larger than order one. Uh, but what we um, see is that there are a lot of ad hoc, you know, kind of techniques, like you have to be very smart about how you choose your closure problem and all these things. Um, so uh, I think the, um, you know, uh, what I was referring to is the fact that um, if uh, you use classical, like the most basic closure problem uh, uh, formulation, you won't be able to upscale at higher damp color numbers. If you want to go to higher damp color numbers, then you have to, as you said, use maybe non very straightforward approaches to try to get around certain terms that appear and you have to take care of. Um, uh, so I don't know if that answered your question. It's it's like very ad hoc. What we did here in Symbolica in those two preprints uh, is essentially we automated a strategy uh, that uh, in which the code based on the PDs that it finds can postulate a much more complex closure variable, closure problem, uh, excuse me, um, uh, uh, po postulate closure form uh, that can account for all those additional terms that would emerge as a result of increasing reaction. So it, it, it's, it, it's a methodology that then is general enough ca that can be automated. Uh, I think I, indeed I, I agree with, I mean, but I was mentioning the uh, ad hoc solution, or maybe, I mean, there are other strategies when you consider high Peclay number, very high. But for high damp color, indeed, uh, at the end of the day, you end up with equilibrium models, but they don't have to be like this at the poor scale, at least to my knowledge. But of course, I might be, you know. But like, sure. for example, have you seen upscaled uh, model? And again, I might I might not be aware of it. Have you seen upscaled yeah. models for, for example, damp color numbers or they're like epsilon to the minus two? Uh, yeah, I, I excluding mean... infinite. The, the infinite, I think no, it's no, like... Yeah. A, um, you know, like where you have when it's not infinite because it's not equilibrium, right? But where you have like this intermediate large uh, damp color number, and if you have, please send. You know, I, I would be very interested in seeing the the papers because you know this is something that we must include in our revisions. <laughs> I think you can include them, and there are there. And I mean, we even tried something like epsilon minus one. That's it works. Yes, I mean, yes, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yes. And minus two, uh, it's. I mean, it, it works, but I mean, then then basically you lose. Uh, I mean, you you have to be careful how you do. It, I, I agree. I agree. In fact, I think that the issue is that it really depends. The, the fact whether or not you can upscale really depends on your closure form, right? Yeah. And so again, all these upscaled models will change if you change the closure form. So whenever I talk about applicability conditions, I always talk about applicability conditions attached to that specific form of upscaled equation. So for that classical form of upscaled equations, the applicability conditions of the damp color number is quite strict. However, if you're willing to go to a different form of upscaled equation, which accounts for closure forms that are more sophisticated, then yes, you, your Absolutely. applicability conditions on the damp color number increases. And if you are willing to look at another yet more sophisticated and more complex form, then yes. So the applicability conditions, it's, it's not like a general applicability conditions for all upscaled model. It's really attached to that specific PDE that you have derived. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Now I understood. And of course, I would not disagree with you at the end of the day, because that's a special <laughs> thing. No, but I totally agree. Indeed, if you look for a particular upscaled model, then indeed, it, they do not. I mean, you have, you cannot get, if you don't use the proper regime, you will get something else. I exactly. totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Sorry, you I, I, I imagine you, you had a lot of questions for, <laughs> for Elenia. No, I keep my the, mouth shut. In the audience, I, I said, oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have only, 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 only one question uh, that, that I want to just to, to it's more a curiosity. Uh, 
the, 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 did the spelling model are still, uh, uh, as far as understood, maybe I, I'm, I'm missing something, are still uh, uh, based on the assumption of periodicity or there is a possibility of uh, uh, maybe replacing it with a, a random, a random field of variation of uh, a random structure. So, um, okay, so the, uh, okay, so technically homogenization theory is based on a periodic, periodic assumption, okay? Um, uh, I think, uh, however, the unit cell can be as complex as you want. Like I, I depict it as, as a sphere, but in reality, it can be really anything. So you can take an XTT image of your porous medium that you find representative and, you know, get that. Um, uh, so... Uh, the, so the random structure, again, it depends if it's related to complexity or if it's really related to randomicity. Uh, if it's, if it's uh, random and therefore it could be considered homogeneous, right, on a given scale, then these methods would work. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, heterogeneity on a finite scale then it's different because essentially in this in this particular theory we are not handling boundary conditions we are not handling you know the upscaling is always in a bulk so as long as you can define a bulk within your heterogeneity then you know this model can be used in each um, of the heterogeneous uh, inclusions right um kyle however plans to generalize this to um you know uh really heterogeneous structure so i'll be waiting for uh his okay. uh okay. his results <laughs> how long does it take to learn uh symbolica so uh, <laughs> well well actually you know as i told you uh with uh, you know with uh, two undergraduate students one uh, was a junior and one was a sophomore um mm -hmm. they used it and validated it in eight weeks oh, okay. they they used it for a for a complex systems like hydrogen storage with eight reactions and co2 sequestration with six reaction they could create the inputs run the code and validate it numerically in-house uh, it's still not available uh, but we hope uh, once the preprint you know hopefully uh, are published we'll publish the the code with those papers uh, so it should become available you know uh, hopefully relatively soon okay so it's it's fast it's not it's not um difficult as doing homogenization theory let's put it that way <laughs> okay yeah it's probably one afternoon to set up the equations and then 15 minutes for code to run right yes <laughs> yeah in fact yeah Okay, I think uh, we can thank again uh, Elenia for a nice talk.